We're continuing tonight in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. This is the, the chapter where we're getting into some very practical matters of how the kingdom works and what God intends for us to do and be. And of course, you want to take these texts very seriously. On the eve of his death, Jesus told his disciples he was going away. And it was a hard night for them. They began to sorrow. They were very much attached to Jesus. And he told them sorrow is going to fill your heart, but you, you'll be... You'll be happy again. He said, I tell you the truth, when you got to see the heart of Jesus in this, of course. It's expedient for you that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send. I will send him to you. Amen. Now you see at that time the disciples couldn't imagine the work of God continuing on earth without Jesus' presence. They, they just couldn't. I guess most of us would feel that way if we'd been in his presence. You know, you just couldn't imagine that the work would continue on without him. They hadn't grasped yet what God was really doing through his son. In fact, they didn't have a whole lot of understanding of him being God's son yet. This is going to change, of course. They could not conceive of a work with the magnitude of Jesus was doing continuing after he left. This just, just didn't make sense. You remember even after he rose from the dead, the two on the road to Emmaus, they, that's what they thought, that we thought he's the one. I mean, their hopes had all been dashed to the ground. Now you might be surprised how this mindset still exists today. The devils brought it up. There are hosts of Christians that don't believe Anything of any magnitude can happen unless Jesus' physical presence is here. So the whole massive doctrine has been developed about this. Yeah, right. And believe me when I say it's a massive doctrine and it permeates the entire way people read the Bible and it de determines how they think and this is the, uh, this is the mode of thinking in the vast majority of Christendom. You'll be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't think like this. They're looking forward to a golden age in the earth with men in the flesh. When Jesus is gonna come back, he's gonna sit on a physical throne in Jerusalem and he's gonna govern the world and the world's gonna be at peace. That's the same mindset the disciples had. Yeah, yeah. Amen. But see, it's inexcusable. Yeah. This should not be tolerated. Amen. Every preacher who preaches this should be summarily ostracized yeah. from preaching and teaching. Yeah. This is a throwback to how the disciples felt before Jesus died. That's, the devils renewed this. And it's caused Christians to mope about yeah. in hopes that finally it's going to be turned around we'll, and we'll be the bosses of the world. And Well, it's a serious, serious thing. See, the work of redemption, what God's doing, that isn't even what he's doing. That overstates the devil. That misrepresents the enemy. Yeah. It paints him as being too strong. Jesus can stop the whole thing right from heaven right now. Uh -huh. yeah. Amen. 
Doesn't even take his personally. Let an angel throw him in the bottomless pit. Let an angel chain him up and throw him in. Doesn't even take the Son of God to do it. Praise God. See? Now see, the fact that we're teaching, teaching now in this fourth chapter, this does not make sense to people that accept this other. Because they don't place a value on what Jesus does from heaven. Well, I don't care what they say. There's a lot of talk. I mean, a lot of books about Jesus and stuff like this, but it's just talk. They, but they don't believe, They don't know God's working from heaven, that Jesus can do more from heaven than he can on earth. They don't know this, even though he's demonstrated it. Our text commences to expound what Jesus is doing now. And that's what salvation is about, what Jesus is doing now. Listen, we're living this. This is the day of salvation. As 1 Corinthians 6, 2, this is the accepted time. Jesus has been exalted to David's throne, as Peter said. He's sitting on it now. And he's ruling. But here's what the world doesn't know. He's not ruling to subdue the enemy. That's not even a challenge to Jesus. He defeated the enemy in his, in his entirety at his lowest point. So there really isn't any enemy left for Jesus to defeat. <laughs> he's, he has foes or his footstool already. All we're going to see is he's going, to, he's going to make it known, that's all. All he has to do is show up and everybody will know who's, who's the winner. So those who speak about what Jesus is going to do in the world to come at his second coming, don't talk about what we're going to talk about. And they do not do it, to be sure. Our text has told us about the singularity of the kingdom, that there's one hope, in one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father who is above all and through all and in you all. And he ascended back to heaven. He wrapped up what he was doing on earth. It's wrapped up. And he went back to heaven. And he gave gifts to men. That's what we're going to look at tonight, what he gave. Gave gifts to men. And nothing can hinder these gifts because he led captivity captive. He has put a chain, so to speak, on the enemy. He can still roam about, but he's on a leash. John Bunyan saw this truth sitting in prison for 14 years because he wouldn't pray out of the Anglican prayer book. And he pictured a pilgrim walking on the highway of holiness and there are lions on the side. He didn't know they were chained up. Yeah. <laughs> Looked like they could get up on the highway, but then he noticed they, they couldn't get up on there. See. Yeah. If you get where Jesus puts you, uh -huh. Satan can't reach you. Amen. Oh, you got to see this. I mean, this is categorically taught. John said the wicked one, whoever's begotten of God keeps himself, and the wicked one touches him not. I mean, it's, there it is. It's right. in the scriptures. Amen. So what were these gifts? That's what we're going to commence tonight. Verse 11. And he gave some... Apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Amen. These are the Ephesian version of spiritual gifts. But he's dealing with the, with the core. 
There are some spiritual gifts that are on the periphery. There are some at the heart. She's talking about the ones that are at the heart. Now this means that he is he hasn't finished his work. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now the term finished work of Christ is not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's a sense in which I know what it means. In dealing with sin, that work has been finished. Yeah. But that phrase is not in the Bible. And it's good not to get used to using it all the time because a lot of people don't know what you mean. Finished work of Christ means he finished what was required to put away sin. Having done it, he went back home. Mm -hmm. The next time he comes, it's the grand wrap-up. That's the part that's been accomplished. Now he's entering into the work associated with fulfilling the eternal purpose. Jesus is a worker, you know, he's working now. Amen. And if you're working, it hasn't been finished yet. That ought to be pretty evident. Before he left, he told his disciples, Now, when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, not from the throne on Jerusalem, from the Father, mm -hmm. even the Spirit of truth which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Then, you, then you're going to begin to understand me then. Mm -hmm. He's going to open it up to you. Testify of me, about me. And Peter preached that this had happened. Mm -hmm. The day of Pentecost. He said, Acts 2.33, Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he said, I'll, I'll send the Spirit. Remember he said, from the Father I'll send the Spirit. From the, I'll get him from the Father, send him to you. So he said, hey, that's how Peter said, having received of the Father, the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which she now see and hear. It says he, he sent the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, Peter, he's preaching. Mm -hmm. He's preaching about Christ, things that he, he didn't see that clearly mm -hmm. just a few days before. Yeah. He saw it now, the Holy Spirit teaching him. Some of the things Jesus is currently doing, and here's just a few of them, he's interceding for those that are coming to the Father by him. Yeah. And he's teaching his people, giving them understanding of himself and of God. And he's teaching the people, if he, Ephesians 4, 20 through 24 tell us, he's teaching the people to put off the old man, not that they ought to do it, how to do it. Amen. He's teaching them to put off the old man and put on the new man. It's something he's doing now. And he's dispensing grace and peace which come from God and the Lord Jesus Christ. If he's one to it. He's maintaining fellowship with his people. This is just some things he's doing now. Well, whatever's being done in the name of the Lord now, is Jesus is doing it. Amen. <laughs> whatever God's doing now, Jesus is the one that's executed it. Now it says this, he, that's the one we're talking about, he gave, he gave. I like the sound of it. I said in the eighth verse, he has given gifts to men. Now he goes back and addresses, he's addressing that matter. The NIV says it was he, that he that was exalted, it was he that gave the gifts he gave were he has given, he therefore, that is in view of the fact he's been exalted, he gave the gifts because he's been exalted and that's what the exalted one was to do, give the gifts. He himself appointed and gave men to us because we'll see the gifts were men, what they were. <clears throat> These are gifts referenced by the six, Psalm 68, 18 except it's been elevated in Christ. See, Jesus first plundered principalities and powers that would have stopped the gifts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He first plundered principalities and powers. Now the way is clear. Yeah, Just yeah, yeah. give the gifts yeah. to the people. 
Now, once exalted, Jesus turns his attention to, of all things, the church. <laughs> it's very interesting yeah. Yeah. how this was obscured to people. Most people think of Jesus with his eye on the world. That's not true. Or oh, it isn't he's disinterested in him. He's the savior of the world. Understand. But he's turned his attention to the church. You want to know what the world gets from Jesus? Zip. You want something from Jesus? You have to be in Jesus. You have to be in his body. You want something from Jesus? You don't get anything. He doesn't give anything to anybody else. That's God's purpose. God's purpose is to take out a people for his name. As Acts 15 says, that's what God's doing. God is taking the people out, yeah. not putting the people in, mm -hmm. taking them out. And Jesus is uh, doing this. This body of people that he's nurturing is going to be his wife. This is his future wife. He's not going to flirt with somebody else. Yeah. We've been betrothed to Christ. It would, it, <laughs> I don't like Christ being misrepresented as having more, more interest in the lost than in the saved. I don't like this because the lost aren't his bride, the saved are. That doesn't mean he's not interested in the lost. Don't anyone be so foolish to say that. We're talking about his attention, <laughs> his focus, his emphasis, what he's doing now. He's ministering to them. He's bringing the sons home to glory. That's what he's doing. Now Paul makes it clear in his text. These gifts are confined to the church. They are not any place else. They're not for anybody else. They're to perfect and mature the church. That's what these, that's what these gifts are for. We're going to talk about. So at this time the stress is getting the sons home to glory through the devil's territory and interceding for them. He's the great shepherd of the sheep, not the goats. He's not the shepherd of the goats. He's, a, he's the ruler of the goats, but he's the shepherd of the sheep. Go ahead. I give my life for the sheep. Amen. It's in there. All, it's all yeah. in there. Yeah. But you maybe can remember when it, it, this wasn't quite so clear. I, boy, I, was, it was, I had suffered the same dilemma. I bought into a system that wasn't in the Bible. It wasn't even in the Bible. I thought that's what the Bible was about. And of course, when I gave myself, devoted myself to ingesting the scriptures, then I found that out. I said, hey, God's not talking about what we were talking about. The ongoing progressive change is taking place through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's like, this is what God is doing through Christ now. Who's doing it through the Spirit? who distributes the gifts himself, Holy Spirit. And so this progressive change that is fitting the people to be Christ's bride. Now Jesus is not going to marry a harlot. Right. Would you expect him to? Well, a person who's worldly, that's what they're saying. A Christian's worldly, they're saying they expect Jesus to marry a harlot, and he will not. He will not. You say, what about Hosea? He did, yeah, that was to show what Israel was and how God felt about it. But see, that's, there's a new covenant now. There's a new people now. They're shaping them for the wedding. So Jesus is the one that gives this, gives these. Of course, you can't build careers on any of these things we're going to mention can't make a name for yourself on any of these. These are all calculated for one thing, uh, to build up the church of Christ. In other words, Jesus, this is Jesus building his church. That's what this, this is how he's building his church. Not just building the church doesn't just mean adding more members to it, although he's, that is happening. Added to the, he added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So that's taking place. But that's building the church. That's not what building the church is. Building the church has to do with strengthening, fortifying, making strong, edifying, making the church suitable 
as a habitation for God. So that if God moves in, the walls don't bust out. Yes? Considering um, a builder cannot continue to add bricks to his house and expect it to stand, he must continue to add materials to make it stronger. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. There are people, of course, that are that are added. They're added to the Lord and to the body. But the objective is make the body strong. Yeah, Not make the body big, yeah. make the body strong. Yeah. That's the objective. That Now that takes a king in heaven to do that. <clears throat> He's maturing them so they can stand against the wiles of the devil because they're in his territory. He's perfected them under every good work, the scripture says. All of this is involved in Jesus building his church. And he's building it from heaven. He's not building it from earth. And he's already defeated all the foes, so there's no need to defeat the foes. They've all been defeated. They know it. It's that people don't know it, but they know it. And as soon as his glory appears, they just fall down. That's it. Confess him. All right, here's the, here's, he gave some. That is, this, everybody isn't this. This is selective. It's discretionary. It's who, who, who occupies these offices we're going to mention is determined by heaven, not on earth. He gave some to be apostles and some prophets. Well, look at those first. As I told you, and these, this takes gifts or people. Paul thought the same way. He said, who are Paul's? Paul, who is Apollos? Who's his? But ministers whom God hath given. Amen. Right? The gifts yeah. given to every man. So that's gifts for men. Amen. These gifts can't be created by men. I mean, you can't produce any of these by a school of some sort. Yeah, right. it, whatever arguments a person may put forward, substantiating the need for Christian education and training and so forth, after all said and done, you're going to have a hard time proving that from the scripture. Just to say it mildly. Hard time. There's not a man who has lived or lives now who can prove that Jesus administers these gifts through an institution originated by man. That postulate cannot be proved. And I would challenge the world on it. I'd be willing to meet anybody, any place, any time on that proposition. No matter how educated they are. These, what we're talking about here is not done by an earthly institution. And a lot of people don't know that, to say the least. Further, the immediate... Uh, context of this verses of this chapter verse 11 through 16 as well as the overall context which tells you what God did and how he, what he did to the people and how Jesus handled the people the context of the whole teaching shows us that this work we're talking about a work done on the church by deity that's what we're I mean, he went out of his way to teach this to us. These are the ones that uh, God chose, God predestinated, God accepted them, God redeemed them, God forgave them. He, he talked about, so what sense does it make to do that and then turn your attention to somebody else? Does this make sense? Does this sound, sound like something God would do? That he choose someone, predestinate someone, make someone accepted, put him in Christ, give him all things pertaining to life of God, and then turns attention to somebody else. Does that make sense? These are the ones that are, are obtaining an inheritance, he taught us. These are the ones who are sealed with the Holy Spirit. In fact, these are the ones Paul prayed for. We have no record of Paul ever praying for heathen. Of course, to disprove that, you just got to find the text where he did, and it will apologize, and all will be over. 
There's no record of that. He had a burden for the Jews. No, he didn't have a burden for the Italians. Okay, what about going to Spain? Well, going to Spain, does that mean he had a burden for Spain? Or were there Jews in Spain? He never, no, where did he have this? Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He didn't weep over, weep over Alexandria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He didn't weep over Athens. Not even Samaria. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you where God's attention is, see. Yeah. Now, you don't have to take that and say that he despises everybody else. And won't. That's not what we're saying. Mm -hmm. We're saying the only way those people are going to be reached is if these people yeah. shape up that God's attention is on. That they all may be one, as our Father art and me and I and thee, that they may be one in us, that, that, the world may believe thou hast sent me. And until that happens, evangelism and missions are a lost cause. A fractured church is not going to reach the world. Does it make any difference what men say? And listen, people, there are billions and billions. You think the government budget is big? If you want to know how many dollars have been spent on missions and on youth movements, and if you had any remote idea how many billions of dollars and hours and people have been poured into that, and we not made an inch of progress in the last 50 years. Why not? Doing the wrong thing. You grow people up in Christ Jesus and the last thing you have to worry about is them witnessing. Uh -huh. Amen. You've seen it in our prayer request. You've seen it right here. Mm -hmm. Nobody told these people to eat, go out and try and find somebody to talk to. That's just what they did. Yeah. If Jesus came to seek and save the lost, if he's dwelling in you, don't think he'll do something else. You'll do the same thing. You not, this isn't done by commandment. This is done by change. Mm -hmm. Something that God's doing in, from heaven. Apostles. He gave some mm -hmm. to be apostles. Some other versions say special ability as apostles. He gave some to be apostles, special messengers. Now the apostle word apostle here is used in the purest sense of the word. Like twelve apostles. See there are, Barnabas is called an apostle. But he wasn't an apostle like the twelve apostles were. They were apostles of Christ. Yeah, that's right. Not in Barnabas and Saul when they first were not were apostles of the church and of the spirit. The spirit said separate me Barnabas and Saul and says and the church sent them. That's not how the twelve went out. That's not how Paul the apostle went out. He was not sent by the church. He was sent by the head of the church. Yeah. Amen. So the apostles, are some, not just someone sent, they're sent with a message. Uh -huh. These apostles were given some information nobody else was given. And if you want to get it from them, you want to get this information, you got to get it from them. Jude knew that. He said, be mindful of the words of the apostles. Yeah. But they knew things nobody else knew. Yeah. So a person can say, well, I'm just going to ask God to show me these things. No, you have to, some things, you've got to get them from the apostles. They are the foundation layers, and you've got to get it from them. That's the apostles we're talking about here. Another man, as I mentioned, Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. There are some texts that refer to people that sounds like they may be considered apostles. So, so there was a couple that were of note among the apostles, and some mean they were called apostles, but the text doesn't actually say that. Barnabas is the only one that specifically is called an apostle. And that trait goes back to his call by the Spirit in Acts 13. The word apostle means a messenger, one sent with orders. In this case, directly sent by Christ. Even when he was on earth, he sent out the 12. Then he sent out the 70, remember. But the 70 weren't apostles. 
12 where they were apostles, specially sent. But he chose them that they might be with him and preach, the scriptures say. Peter said, be mindful of the words as were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles. <laughs> no, don't forget what we apostles said. I'm sure you know this, but there are a great number of people that are not, don't have a very good working knowledge of what the apostles said. They may know what David said, maybe what Moses said, but they don't know much about what the apostles said. Now the apostolic office was not passed down from generation to generation, even though there are some circles today where they call their leaders apostle. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's not that it's unlawful to call them an apostle, it's just that that doesn't carry authority. Apostle is not a word that carries authority unless you're talking about the 12. It just means you sent. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're carrying someone else's message. Yeah. But the, the apostolic office, as used in this text, was not passed down. The reason is we have their doctrine in, in print. Mm -hmm. yeah. Doesn't have, they don't have to be passed, passed along because if you've got the record of what they taught. Mm -hmm. yeah. And actually very few Apostles, we, we, don't, we know very little about what other apostles said aside from Peter and John. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Matthew, if you want to include Matthew's gospel. We don't, but you don't need to have any other record because they had a, they had a united message. They, yeah. they all preached yeah. the same thing. So yeah. it wasn't necessary to, we don't have any. In fact, aside from Peter and John, there's no other apostle mentioned after Acts 12. Mm -hmm. They're never referred to. The others, other than he appeared to the, you take you back to the, uh -huh. to the resurrection, but not me. But that doesn't mean they weren't working. Yeah, that's right. Their spokesman apparently was Peter. Uh -huh. In fact, Paul indicated this when he said that the Peter had been given the apostleship to the circumcision. Well, actually, it was the twelve apostles that were given. Remember, Jesus said in the Regeneration will sit on 12 tribes judging the 12, 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they actually the 12 apostles were sent to the, to the Jews, but, but he, Peter was like the, the main person. And then Peter, I and mean, then Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. The 12 were gifts to the smallest group of people. <laughs> the smallest group of people got 12. The biggest group of people got one. <laughs> What's the difference? Was the greater truth revealed to that one? Yeah. That one got more truth. Yeah. Nobody else taught. I think I've listed on like 70 some things Paul taught that nobody else taught. Nobody. Yeah. Wasn't that he was smarter? Was that he was God? I can see why God did this. Now, he's the Gentiles. He told the Jews, I'm going to provoke you to jealousy. You provoke me to jealousy with other gods, and I'm going to provoke you to jealousy with a people that's not a people. That's the Gentiles. But see, the Gentiles are really, they're kind of dumb. Because they actually got, the, they got it up on the Jews. God gave them an apostle with a lot more information, and they're so retarded, they haven't taken advantage of it. Well, this is the truth. So what's going to happen then? God's going to toss the ball back <laughs> to the Jews. And it's what it would be like waking up the dead. Yeah. Oh, when that happens, things are going to kick off. So the apostles, the 12 apostles were the foundation stones of the New Jerusalem, which is really, it's, it's the Jews' tree in the Jews' house. But we've been added to it. You see, <laughs> as the apostle of the Gentiles, Paul was not only given insights, he wrote all of his letters to the churches or to key mm -hmm. Christian people. There's no record in Scripture. There's only, we only have Theophilus, and he was evidently a believer. Luke wrote, a couple of, wrote his gospel and the book of Acts to Theophilus, who was a a political dignity of some sort. But he, but Luke didn't like tell him anything new. 
he just rehearsed what what the other apostles had said, and particularly from Acts 13 on, which focuses on Paul, you know. So I'm showing you here that there were, he gave apostles a unique gift to the church who through whom he funneled all of the key or foundational information. No foundational truth was revealed to anybody else. So people say today, this is what God's doing today. See, they've lied. Mm -hmm. That's right. They're not telling the truth. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of this going on now, brethren. Oh, yeah. You see, there's been a shift in doctrinal emphasis. There's been a shift to health and wealth and things of this sort. Yeah. And so they, you've got to come up with some kind of an explanation. Yeah. Because this is obviously not what the apostles preached. So they say, well, this is when he's fulfilling some of these other things. It's a new wave. No, he's doing a new thing, though. <laughs> he's, he's, the new thing he's going to do is convert people. Yeah. Yeah. Not a new doctrine. Yeah. Okay, it's time to be apostles. These apostles were given to the church by Jesus. And aside from the books of Matthew, written by Matthew, and the Gospel of John, the church is abysmally ignorant of the rest of the writings of the apostles. Whether you talk about Romans, or Corinthians, or Galatians, or Ephesians, or Philippians, or Colossians, or Thessalonians, or Timothys, or Titus, or Philemon, the first and second Peter, the first, second, third John, and Revelation, those, those are the books concerning which people are at a phenomenal level of ignorance. What does that mean? They have not received these gifts. No Christian has a right to remain ignorant of something that was revealed to the apostles. Amen. We understand that there'll be a time in the beginning stage where the people don't understand, but no one has a right to stay that way. And there are people, most of the people, I blush to say, have remained in a state of ignorance. And this is serious business. Because if they don't receive the apostles, they haven't received Christ. Hmm? Yeah. Jesus, Jesus told his disciples. He said, if they don't listen to you, yeah. they won't listen to me. If they don't receive you, they won't receive me. If they don't receive me, they won't receive God. Yeah. Made it clear. Yeah. See, are you saying that there's people that haven't really received Christ? Yes. Mm -hmm. I just don't know who they all are and would make no attempt to identify it. Mm -hmm. But if people do not take advantage of who Jesus sent it can only be because they haven't received Jesus. I, don't, I think that is pretty well substantiated by Jesus himself. And he, he gave prophets. Now he's not talking here about the Old Testament prophets. Because these are gifts he gave after he was exalted. But it's the man Christ Jesus gave these gifts. Amen. The other prophets that were sent by God. See, he's not, so he's not talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. These are in the church. In fact, 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says he set the prophets in the church. Those prophets back there were, made, were not made perfect without us. So they say they're not, this is the prophecy he's talking about. Prophecy in the church. By definition, well, here's what some other versions, how some other versions read it. To others, he has given the gift of being able to preach well. as a living Bible. Some prophets inspired teachers and expounders, the Amplified. These are gifts given by Christ of people that have insight into what has been revealed. There's not new things aren't revealed to them. They were given to the apostles. Mm -hmm. But they have insights that opens up to them and they're able to exhort 
and admonish and comfort. Edify, exhort, and comfort the saints. He that prophesies speaks unto edification, exhortation, and comfort. So they have an insight that makes actually makes the saints stronger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It actually comforts and calms their spirit mm -hmm. down. And it moves them. They have a message that compels people uh, to act upon the word. Uh -huh. This prophet is the second highest office in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28 says, He fed first in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets. So they're rank number two. At the church at Antioch, they had a lot of prophets that were there. Acts 13 tells you. Church at Jerusalem, there were certain prophets that came down from Jerusalem. They had prophets. Church at Corinth had prophets. Prophets. I believe we have some prophets. Mm -hmm. Amen. And who can open up the truth of God. Get, these, are, these came from God. These are like, like, not like people that studied the Bible a lot and got a lot of understanding. That's not what we're talking about here. Yeah, that's right. I believe my father was a prophet. Mm -hmm. He saw things you could study 50 years, you wouldn't see what he saw. This is the difference of a prophet, someone who's a prophet, mm -hmm. who God opens up the things that God did. You could still hope and study your Bible for the next 20 years, and you wouldn't get what that person got in five minutes. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Why? He's a prophet that's given to the church. Uh -huh. The aim isn't to make you smart. The aim is to make the church fit. Yes. Amen. Amen. That's what Jesus is doing. Jesus isn't holding personal classes for every person so they'll have a lot of knowledge, be very satisfied. That's not, that'll happen, I understand, but that's not what he's doing. What he's doing is preparing the church to be married to him. And to make, safely make the transition from here to glory. Not everybody's a prophet. And if you live long enough, you should be able to recognize when someone is. One time Paul was writing to the Corinthians, and it was a, they, they couldn't uh, <laughs> accept what he was saying. He said, now if any man is a prophet, says he's a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if a person's a prophet, he can say, yeah, that's the truth, what that man's saying. But it took a prophet to do it. Now, about the time, you, you, one of the most overworked words in the religious language is study. <coughs> and I come from a background where that was a dignified word, study. Everything was studied. We studied, study. We just studied and studied, and everybody was dumb anyway. Study, study, study. We're not against study. I'm a student. Anyone that knows me knows that I study. And they also know they don't study as much as I do. But that's not, that's not how this comes. That's right. It'll drive you to study, I'll tell you that. But a prophet can put things together. <clears throat> uh -huh. A prophet isn't someone who says, Whoop, it's a major storm coming. Well, there are prophets that did things like that, but that's not the kind of thing he's talking about. He's not talking about prophets like Agabus. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He said, bonds and imprisonment await you in Jerusalem. That was a supernatural insight. Yeah, uh -huh. But that's not what he's talking about here. What he's talking about here, as the rest of the text is going to establish. Now, I'm not just out in the left field here. The rest of the text is going to tell you why he did these things. Uh -huh. And it's so that the people of God end up Filled with all the fullness of God. So he's going to tell you what it's all about. <clears throat> Prophets. That's not all. And some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now, all of these are for the body. Now, he's going to tell you this very soon. Very, the next verse is going to tell you. So he's outlining the teaching ministries that are in the church. Part of the church. <coughs> now there's a <coughs> text in 1 Corinthians 12 that kind of gives us a good perspective. 
on spiritual gifts and how to view them. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God set some in the church. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. After, if you don't have those first three, I'm not going to pay any attention to what you say about miracles. I don't know what kind of evidence you produce. I don't care. And it may be genuine, but I'm not going to listen. I'm not going to listen to a miracle monger if there's not been the effect of apostles, prophets, and teachers. If they haven't preceded what's going on, you've got Corinth duplicated again, which is one of the worst churches in the Bible. And they came behind in no gift. Not no gift like apostles, prophets, and teachers. No gift like tongues, interpretation of tongues, he, healings, gifts, gifts of healing. That, that's the plural. Gifts of healing. These are legitimate, but they're after. Yeah. So Paul's taking the uh, the main ones. It's interesting to observe that teaching ministries, as here revealed, are almost absent, totally absent from the modern church. We got a whole new new set of ministries: worship leader, youth leader, marriage leader. <laughs> we got a, a new set of ministers that men have cooked up. Yeah. They're not here. Uh -huh. <clears throat> you know that we shouldn't be against it. Well, look what it's produced, brethren. All you have to do is look at some fruit. Pick out some fruit and look at it. Is that the kind of fruit God produces? No, it's not. These are the gifts. Well, let's look at them. Evangelist. An evangelist is a proclaimer. Someone who announces good news. In fact, some of the versions call him a preacher of good news. Proclaimer of good news. The Living Bible throws this in. A special ability in winning people to Christ. Yeah, that, that's not inherent in the word, and that's not what he's talking about here. Some go and tell the good news. That's the English Revised Version. Some evangelists preach to the gospel, traveling missionaries. That's the Amplified. I can go with the travel part. Evangelists are proclaimers. Not ABC proclaimers, not how to be saved proclaimers, but the good news proclaimers. And if you check Paul's writings, you will find apostles like he, they were all of these gifts that were in one, one person. They were, they had them all, so to speak. You'll find that he's always preaching the gospel to believers. Now, this is a gift God put in the church. It's a gift of being able to proclaim, powerfully proclaim and announce what Christ, who Christ is and what he's done. They say, they're able to powerfully proclaim it. Sometimes they'll say things, once you hear it, it's plain, but you did, just hadn't thought about it that way. Someone may be able to take home and say the head of the church and say it in such a way that suddenly it bursts on you. He's the, he's the head of the church. Burst, I burst on you. But he took away the sins of the world. But they proclaim it with such power. Now here's what I'm going to say. That faith rests in this proclamation. Faith rests in the proclamation of the gospel. You cannot create by faith, create faith or strengthen faith by telling people what they ought to do. Now, they do have to be told what to I understand that, but we're talking about causing faith to come and strengthening faith. Faith comes by hearing, not just hearing a word, comes by hearing the good news of Christ, as is outlined in Romans, the 10th chapter. So every church, to be a valid church, 
and a true church needs somebody that is consistently proclaiming the central message of Christ. Amen. It's a continual type thing. Corinth missed out on it, so Paul said, I'm going to come back and preach again to you the gospel. I'm going to, I'm going to preach. They should have had somebody there doing it all along. Evangelists, proclaimers of good news. Philip was an evangelist. We do know he went down to Samaria and preached Christ. He wasn't like itinerant at that point. Timothy was an evangelist. All we know about Timothy is what he did with churches. We don't, we didn't, we don't know anything else. Because what he did with churches, but he was evangelist and was told to do the work of an evangelist. That's the two evangelists we know about in Scripture. Yeah. After the gospel had been preached and That's established right. in their hearts. That's right. You can see that I can you can see this, I know, brethren brothers and sisters, that the progress you have made has been because you have an enlarged view of Christ. Amen. That's the reason for your progress. It isn't because you have a better understanding of the home or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. That's not it. That's fine if you have it. That's fine. We don't we don't denigrate that at all. What we're saying is, if you want the real work of God to be done in you, you have got to be focused on Christ, and the gospel focuses on Christ. And you will never grow so far you don't need the gospel. It's inside the entirety of the holy city. <laughs> In fact, the epistles are, in fact, an exposition of the gospel. <laughs> the gospel is to be preached to the church, and I gave you some text there. And this is what creates faith. This is faith comes, that's the foundation. See, faith has just founded on Christ, and the gospel is the message of Christ. There's an approach to gospel teaching that was honed to a fine edge in the group with which I was identified, that said you preach to sinners and you teach the church. And they even went into the Greek and a bunch of stuff, come up with all of this. But then he had this, he had this trouble because Peter and the apostles taught Jewish unbelievers. Now, what do you do with this now? This, this contradicts this doctrine. That's what it says. It taught in the, in the temple. They taught Jewish unbelievers. Paul and Barnabas taught unconverted Gentile cities. Taught them. Acts 14.22. They also continued preaching and teaching in Antioch. Paul was ready to preach the gospel, to preach it to the Roman believers. And said he would establish them by preaching the gospel. Romans 16.25. And he also preached to the church in Corinth. So evangelists doesn't mean just to the lost. Yes, they preach in Athens. Yes, they preach in Samaria. Yes, but you will find that is always the exception, never the rule. You just have to, if you know your scriptures now, you know this is the case. The point is that preaching or declaring and affirming the gospel is an ongoing work within the church, and he set the ch these gifts in the church. That's where he set them. And pastors and teachers. All right, now that is almost universally thought to be two offices. It's not. It's one office. Grammatically, there's no comma after pastors. There's commas after all the others. We'd say pastor slash teacher. That's what, how we would say it. It's a single office. Some of the versions say that some to give care and teaching. See, it's one of us, care and teaching. Shepherds and teachers. Another version says caring for God's people as a shepherd does his sheep, leading and teaching them in the ways of God. Care for and teach God's people, the English Revised Version. Pastor slash teacher, Message Bible. Pastors, shepherds of his flock, and teachers, the Amplified says. So this is one office. One office. There's four gifts. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastor, teachers. Four, not five. Pentecostals and charismatics all talk about the five-fold ministry. 
And we were in India, Brother Ricky and I. I taught on this. He said, it's not five folds, only four. Brother Thomas, who's an astute student of Scripture himself, said, I never heard that before, but he saw it. Four, pastor, teacher. This is another kind of a view of elder. Kind of the same thing. It's a more thorough description of the word teachers, as is mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Apostles, prophets, teachers. See, this is like a breakdown. Put the microscope on it. Teachers aren't just somebody who t tell people new things. Mm -hmm. Teachers have a concern for the flock. Yeah. Uh -huh. They see areas that need to be bolstered up. Yeah. And they take care of the flock and they feed it. See, that's, that's the teacher be like how you'd sum up pastor teachers, how you'd break it down. You don't take the flock someplace where the slumps stumble. Well, that promotes ignorance, mm -hmm. and and you feed them. When you see when you see a deficiency, you f you feed them. Mm -hmm. Not beat them. You feed them. Yeah. Feed them. Remember, the aim is to, as the Ephesians just a few verses later says, grow up into Christ in all things. That's the that's what we're targeting. Then the final target, filled with all the fullness of God. That's that's where we're heading. Yeah. So to do that, you need some people, some gifts in the church that they have a mind for the sheep. They're thinking about them. And they perceive. We need a little bit of this, need a little bit of that. Got to put a little more a little more grace in this. We need a little more. See, they know how to do that. They, these are gifts that Jesus gives. Yeah. This is not people. This is, this is their natural tendency. See, it's totally in all these, you notice that these gifts, they are not only aptitude, there's like a there's character and there's interest and there's commitment and all of it's wrapped up in these gifts. It's just not just an ability. Yeah, that's right. It's more than that. Mm -hmm. It's it's targeted to fulfill God's objective. God has chosen God has told us where he's going with this. He's going to conform the people to his son. That's one view. He's going to fill you with all the fullness of God. There's another view. He's going to marry you off to Christ. There's another view. But to get there, this is how he does it. Amen. He works through various gifts that are in the body. These gifts are part of the body. The apostles, for instance, they weren't the head of the body. They were part of the body. Jesus is the head of the body. And they accepted this. They had no trouble with this, so we shouldn't either. They were part of the body. But they were a key part. And that's what these, these various ministries, they are key parts of the body. Amen. <coughs> yeah, there are some things, for instance, that a pastor or teacher, some things that are on his heart he'd like to, he wants to share with the people, wants to tell the people, but he can't do it. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're, not, they're not ready for this yet. Even though he has this, but this is what he's been thinking about, what he's been studying about. It's what been opening up to him, but he, he. I'm talking about a real now, a real pastor teacher. So here, let me let me give you the words of a pastor teacher. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that's what I've been thinking about. I've been thinking about this great salvation. Oh, yeah. glory to God. Uh, but it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. Yeah, I did. I, I couldn't give that to you. I've often wondered, I wonder what Jude would have said. I wonder what he had to say about the great salvation. <laughs> he, couldn't, he had to stir up because they were sleeping. They were dozing. Yeah. Uh -huh. And you don't preach precious stuff to dozing people. Yeah, that's right. Uh -huh. yeah, they, then now the problem is wake them up. Uh -huh. Get them woke up. Yeah, you can't you can't awaken a dozing person with soothing words. <laughs> but see, a pastor teacher, he sees that. He knows how to do that. Not because God, Jesus sent him in that capacity. Jesus sent him because the church needed people like that. And the bigger the church, the more you need. Oh yeah, 
You know, that's why the church at Antioch, it apparently was a pretty, pretty good size congregation. That's pretty well the consensus of Antioch of Syria. Syria consensus of people was a pretty. It was to the Gentiles like Jerusalem was to the Jews. They had a lot of prophets there. They had a lot of prophets. <clears throat> so here's where the epistles of Peter, Paul, Peter, and John are especially useful. They show the godly discretion that men have. Moral problem in Corinth. See, Paul is a pastor teacher too. He goes right to work on that because he knows a little leaven leavens the whole lamp. If we don't get this thing resolved, we're going to have a, a lot of fornicators in Corinth. See? Paul sees the Galatians. They've been pulled off by these people that insisted on circumcision. He said, I got to got to get to work on that. I got to show them the truth that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So laws are good, but only to get you to Christ. They don't keep you in Christ. He, see, he addressed that. He saw the Colossians. There were some philosophizers coming in and starting to intrigue him with philosophies and this sort of thing. He got right on it right away. Why? Because he knew where God's headed. He knew where God's headed. The people grow up into Christ and all things. Huh? Filled with all the fullness of God, married to Christ, conformed to the Son. See, it's all in scriptures, told of where God's going with this. It's all there. This is how Jesus is making sure it happens. He gives, puts gifts in the church. It's a first Corinthians 12, 18, men. He put the members in the body as it had pleased him. That included apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastor teachers. He put them where it pleased him. Yes, amen. And then as the body is made strong, mm -hmm. they minister to these other to these people. That's right. Which enhances their yes. see it's a it's a complementary type thing. Here's the here's these exalted gifts in the church, but they're designed to get the people up higher than the people edify this they comfort Paul, and he gets higher and see so you keep on spiraling upward, upward, so that the key, the key people are being edified and strengthened as the other people grow. And they give the people more and they grow more. You see how it works. <laughs> well, I think I closed there, but this is a this is a marvelous text of scripture. And now next uh Next installment, we'll get into the details. I'll give you what the first verse says. He gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some events, some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints. There it is. That included evangelists. Now it's great. It's really liberating when you can just accept this and not try and stuff it into a preconceived mold. It's very liberating. And we give honor to the head yes. by submitting to this arrangement. Amen. We give honor to the head, see? Yes. All right, any of you? Yes. Yeah, what Paul's talking about when he talks to the Thessalonians, and he says, well, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which yeah. labor among you yeah. and are over you. And the Lord is talking about yeah. these, oh, yeah, that's right. these right here. That's exactly that's it. Right. Yeah, the ones over you aren't they like the board. You know, it's... <laughs> Them very high. Yeah, very high for their work. For their work. Amen. Yeah, a couple of things. One, um, when you were talking mm -hmm. about how Christ, the focus of Christ is his people. Yeah. And um, we see him turn this way whenever he was getting ready to offer himself. He, he, he left the public teaching. He yeah. didn't teach publicly Good. any mm -hmm. longer. His focus was to make sure that yeah. his apostles were going to stand Good. whenever they were separated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then when he rose from the grave, the world yeah. never saw him again. <laughs> they never saw yeah. him right. after he was crucified and buried. But his apostles and the disciples did. And it was because he was establishing them. He was getting ready for yeah. them, getting them ready to be able to do to do the work that he was going to send them Amen. out to you. Amen. Now see, if you don't know you're in Christ, then these other arguments, they may, they may kind of frighten you. But if you know you're in Christ, what you just said is a tremendous comfort. Because yes. it means his eyes on you. Amen. <laughs> For good. <laughs> 
Anyone else? All right. You have something else? Okay. <laughs> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the body, and for the wisdom, mercy, and peace, and grace that's made known in the way he's governing his body. Oh, Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you for all the gifts that you placed in it. We ask for grace to recognize them and to submit to them with joy that you might work in us to will and do of your own good pleasure. In Jesus' name, amen.